That's if everybody's all set. So I will admit everybody in the waiting room. We'll let them all get into the main room. And I will stop sharing my screen. So hello everybody, welcome to Fall 2020's Alternative Careers in Science event. I'd like to welcome you here. Um, my name is Mary Nucci. I am the Assistant Dean for Community Engagement and a Professor in the Department of Human Ecology on the SEBS campus at Rutgers. So I just want to tell you some ground rules for tonight. We'd ask that you stay muted while the panelists are speaking. You can ask questions in the chat and if they, we will answer them as they come in. But you will have time after the panelists speak to meet individually with them. You'll be able to move between breakout rooms um, later on when we're done and you can go and chat with each of the panelists. And I would suggest that you take the time and, and go into rooms that maybe someone you hadn't thought you'd ever want to talk to or a career you weren't interested in because everybody is here today, first of all, as an alumnus of Rutgers, but are very, very passionate about what they do. And you might learn something really interesting that you can use either to become a career or in your career later on. So I'd like to start with um, asking our three guests from Rutgers to introduce themselves. Brian McGonigal, Jennifer Lenahan, and Mindy Omelia. So I'm gonna ask Brian, could you introduce yourself? And um, then we'll go on to Jennifer and then Mindy. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, my name is Brian McGonigal. I am the manager of alumni community engagement at the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, formerly known as Cook College. Uh, which also includes the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, I've been in touch with actually a few of the panelists here. Uh, thank you for, for volunteering uh, this evening. I'd like to thank and uh, congratulate the students actually uh, who are attending tonight because you're taking advantage of a great opportunity uh, to learn more about uh, careers that are available to you that uh, you may not have known about before. Um, you're obviously career focused, which is great. A lot of students, um, or, or thinking from you know one class to the next, one test to the next, and you're taking some initiative by being here. So thank you for doing that. And I'd also like to thank uh, Stacy, uh, Janae, Mike, Russ, Beth, and Michelle. Uh, thank you so much for volunteering your time here with us this evening to help our students out. We really appreciate you giving back. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Brian. Jennifer? Hello, thank you. So I'm Jennifer Lenahan, and I'm the Director of Career Explorations and Arts and Sciences Initiatives at the Office of Undergraduate Education, uh, the School of Arts and Sciences. And so I'm mainly running a course, a multi-section course for undergraduates in SAS. And so those of you who may be listening in who are studying life sciences on the SAS side, you might want to check out the Career Explorations and Arts and Sciences course, which gives you 14 weeks to really focus on these issues and, and help you figure out your future. Um, and we partner uh, very often with the Office of Career Exploration and Success. So I will hand it over uh, to Mindy. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so glad you came to visit us this evening. Um, as Jennifer said, my name is Mindy Omelia, and I am the program director for the medical sciences and life sciences career communities at the Office of Career Exploration and Success. And uh, Jennifer and I, and Mary, and um, you know many others work you know, together to try and help you um, navigate the career paths that um, you choose um, and figure out what that might be uh, like tonight, uh, creating events that uh, Mary has pulled together. Uh, we support this strongly for exploration because at the end of the day, that'll help you, you know, find the career that's the best fit for you. So I'm, I'm happy to be here, happy to answer any questions and um, uh, looking forward to this evening. Mindy, and for those of you who came a little late, again, I'm Mary Nucci. Um, I have posted in the chat the biographies for the speakers. So if you'd like to um, either open that up when there's for the presentations or have it with you when you join the breakout rooms later, or you can download it and save it. Um, I'm going to do very brief introductions now for each of the speakers. We're going to give them five to seven minutes to tell you a little bit about themselves. And again, we will have not you'll have an opportunity to 
speak to them one-on-one -on -one in breakout rooms later. So we're gonna go in alphabetical order. So speaker by your last name, so speakers, you know where you fall. So I'd like to introduce our first presenter is Stacy Brody. She is the reference and instruction librarian at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, the Himmelfarb Health Sciences Library. So Stacy, thank you very much for joining us tonight and the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so as Mary said, my name is Stacy Brody and I currently work as a medical librarian in the Washington DC area. Um, I graduated SEBS with my bachelor's in agricultural and plant sciences in 2013. And during my undergrad, um, I did a lot of exploration as well. So I was fortunate enough to be able to take advantage of opportunities to do field research, laboratory research. Uh, I did a fair amount of library research, which is probably why I'm a librarian today. Uh, I did internships and then I also attended a fair number of lectures and journal clubs around campus. So I can't um, stress enough exploring and getting involved while you can. Um, so as, um, as I was saying, I was able to take advantage of a number of opportunities, one of which was an internship at a winery. Uh, so that was a really great way to connect my interest in plant and agricultural sciences and use the connection that Rutgers has through the Agricultural Experiment Station to do something kind of interesting and quirky. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it um, and then was able to work at work at the winery full-time managing the tasting room and some other aspects of winery operations. So at that point I was able to gain experiences in management, communications, things you might be learning about in your classes but don't always get time to practice hands-on. Uh, so a really great experience there um, as well as some other skills that they don't always teach you in school. Uh, after that I transitioned to a position in retail wine uh, so just working in a wine store, um, again, thinking about how anything that I'm doing in a job that maybe I didn't intend on exploring after graduation or didn't really think that I would end up doing, what am I learning there? So communications always come through. Things like inventory management, basic trends and data analysis, these things are, are important kind of no matter where I've been and I was able to gain them in a setting that I didn't think I'd work in, but really enjoyed doing. So never discounting jobs that I've taken um, and seeing how they've contributed to uh, an overall really nice CV or resume. Uh, so I'd always thought about going back to school for further education. Um, I was considering I mean, a PhD I'll be right upon, I'm sorry? I'm sorry. Oh, Stacey, okay. think someone is I'm going to mute Unmuted. Everybody. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Um, anyway, so I had always, always thought about going back to grad school, and I really considered going straight for a PhD after getting my bachelor's, um, but there were some things going on in my life that it wasn't the time to do, and I'm, I'm glad I took the break away from academia. So through the career experiences I had between undergrad and grad school, I gained a better understanding of kind of what my professional skills are, where my future professional interests lie. Um, and ironically, the store I worked at uh, was called Wine Library. So I was like, oh, library school seems like a good idea. I like dealing with information. Um, I was looking at, again, trends and data analysis and thought I would go for some type of data management or information management specialization. So that led me back to Rutgers. Uh, but on the other side of campus, um, to the Master of Information program at the School of Communication and Information. Um, and this was one of those things where I had always kind of considered librarianship to be something like I really enjoyed. I, I liked the literature review part of all of the research I did. I liked finding things out and looking in databases, but I didn't really, I always kind of discounted it as an option or I didn't really seriously consider it until later on. So I'm really glad I took the time and then came back. Um, and I really love what I do now. After grad school, I was able to work at the National Institutes of Health at the National Library of Medicine. So that was a really great, exciting opportunity that I hadn't known existed. Um, and they, and to really explore the type of research that goes on 
at an information, um, an information research institute. So really enjoyed that. I worked briefly at the National Agricultural Library, so a different side of science librarianship at the federal level. Um, and then where I am today, I am able to do instruction as well as support the research endeavors at our university. Um, and support healthcare as well. So you can imagine uh, the COVID-19 pandemic presents some really interesting challenges and opportunities for medical librarians as well as academic librarians generally um, trying to provision uh, reliable and relevant information to our communities, um, especially when there seems to be so much information on topics, but maybe not the best information. Um, so I live kind of on the meta side of research. I'm glad I got to do field laboratory and laboratory research, but Working at a bench and collecting data in a field is not something I want to do every day, but I really enjoy learning about how research happens um, and how research gets disseminated and shared. So if you like that part of research and you're interested in that, definitely let me know. Uh, librarianship is a really fun place to be. Thank you, Stacy. Really appreciate that. Librarians are some of my favorite people and you've had a tough situation with COVID these past few months. So. Our next speaker is, is Janai Hollinger. Janai is a public health analyst in the Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration. So Janai, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us tonight. Hello everyone. I am Janae Hollinger, Rutgers alum, class of 2017. And I'm so excited to be speaking with you today and to share my journey thus far. When I began at Rutgers, I wanted to do biomedical engineering. But the more entry level classes I took, the more I realized that that was not the path that I wanted to take. And that was my first pivot. I eventually majored in biological sciences and minor in nutrition and Africana studies. My senior year, I took a class in public health. And it was then that I found the intersection of all my interests. I was amazed by how the body worked, how much it took to keep it healthy, and then how race and ethnicity impacted that. And I also knew by then that I did not want to be in the clinical setting and did not want to be in a lab which is what people typically do with degrees in biological sciences. So pivot number two. I found that the field of public health offered me the opportunity to play a role in healthcare without having to go the traditional route. I also felt I could make more change at a macro level by taking this route. So once I graduated Rutgers, I immediately entered a master's program at the University of Maryland College Park. Um, and I reside in the uh, Washington DC area as well. And last year I received my master's of public health with a concentration in health policy analysis and evaluation. The number one regret I had, unlike our previous speaker, um, I did not do any internships to explore my interests. And because of that regret, I aggressively sought after internships while I was in grad school. So I interned at John Hopkins Healthcare, where I learned about medical policies and how insurers decide what services and treatments to offer the beneficiaries. I interned at a county health department in the Behavioral Health Bureau as a substance abuse and prevention intern. And this was during the same year that the opioid crisis was declared a public health emergency by the Department of Health and Human Services and became the opioid epidemic. And to me, it was very interesting to observe how it was handled at a county level and how much the community gets involved in response to an epidemic that touches so many lives. I interned at a trade association, which is a nonprofit org that helps come up with solutions to industry related issues. It provides different resources for a specific industry and also lobbies for that industry. And there I was really able to explore my interest in policy. I got to go to the Hill with the lobbyists and see him advocate for funding for federally qualified health centers. And I was also there during historic changes to the Medicaid health insurance program. And I witnessed how they had to, had to react to save health insurance for millions of people. My last two internships were at the federal government level at the United States Department of Health and Human Services. And I'm sure by now, <laughs> because of COVID, you are very familiar with the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the agency that's put out many guidelines to abide by during this pandemic, and that's one of my sister agencies. But my actual internships were at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the Health Resources and the Services Administration, or HRSA, which was my final internship site and where I eventually started my first full-time job in the field. And not, not speaking on behalf of HHS or HRSA today, just sharing my um, personal experiences. So with having numer in, numerous internships, I felt like I was able to fill out the environment that was best suited for my career goals and my skills that I wanted to hone in on. And the federal government gave me that high level bird's eye view type of exposure that I thought would be great early on in my career. So currently I'm at HRSA, where I'm a public health analyst in the office of the administrator. And there I do a variety of things which I love about my job. Most recently, I did a deployment with FEMA on a COVID-19 task force, and I helped create a centralized location for policymakers to go to 
to aid in the rapidly changing needs of practitioners during the pandemic. And because I work in the administrator's office, I've also been able to work on uh, quite a few department level health initiatives as well. Now I'm making another pivot and I have recently accepted a position also in the Department of Health and Human Services, but more in legislation because I really want to explore um, my interest in health policy. And I remember being so sad that I actually had to settle down in one job because I loved having different internships, you know, every six to eight months so that I could keep learning and growing. So that's something I always look for in any position that I take. And I predict that I will continue to have pivots in my career as I explore and unearth more interest in the field of public health. And with that, I'll turn it over to the next presenter, but I really look forward to chatting more with students who join the breakout room. Thank you. Thank you, Janai. It is nice to see public health um, people like yourself finally getting the credit you're due. Unfortunately, we had to wait for a pandemic to do that, but thank you very much. So our next speaker is Michael Kalenko. Mike Kalenko is the Predator Curator at Six Flags Great Adventure and Wild Safari. Mike, the floor is yours. All right. So uh, again, Mike Kalenko. I'm a Cook College class of 09. I um, was also a member of the fraternity of Alpha Zeta, um, Kappa class. Um, my major was ecology and natural resource management. Um, and with that, I thought I was going to get a job in fish and game, fish and wildlife, DEP, EPA, something for the government. Um, when I was going through school, um, I also ended up going, um, taking a minor in secondary science teacher education, um, which is links you to the Graduate School of Education at Rutgers. It's a five-year program. You get your master's and you become a teacher. Um, I missed out on my GREs by, I think, like 20 points um, that year. So that path changed. And I said, okay, well, we'll see what to do. And, and I student taught and realized I like biology. I like the stuff that you teach. Um, I love ecology, but biology is okay. Um, and the problem was I hate meiosis mitosis. And if I became a high school biology teacher, I would be teaching meiosis mitosis for quite a few months. Um, so it was one of those things where I went, all right, well, is this really the career path I want to go? So luckily me not getting into the graduate school kind of settled that one for me. Um, but then I said, okay, I'll go EPA, DEP. I split my time between, I had basically equal number of trees and animal courses, um, for ecology. I had an arboriculture, I had a whole bunch of stuff. I kind of hedged my bet. All right, well, if I can get it with this, I can get it with that. I graduated in 09. Um, for those who remember, there was kind of a, like a mini recession um, going on. So all those government agencies I was hoping for, a nice, nice government job. They said like DEP, we're hiring an accountant, that's it. Okay, um, fish and game, we're hiring an office assistant, nothing to do with science. Okay, um, so actually what I ended up doing is um, I, I went to a bunch of job fairs, Rutgers had one. Um, and I walked around and I, I got one for um, selling science equipment for the second company, not Fisher, the company that also sells science equipment. I went for an interview for that. And, and I was honest with the guy. I go, honestly, this isn't what I want to do. Um, but at one of the job fairs, it was, I was just about to leave. I was there for, I think, three, four hours. And I walked past the, the Six Flags one and I forgot, hey, they have animals. Um, I did an internship um, my junior year at uh, Woodlands Wildlife Refuge. It's up in uh, North Jersey. It's the only place that rehabs uh, black bears in the state of New Jersey. So that kind of got my feet into the whole, okay, you know, work with animals is kind of cool. Um, so I lucked out. Um, I started working for them seasonally. It was literally sitting on a gate waving to guests. Um, but because I had a college education, I got promoted pretty quickly. I ended up being a seasonal warden. I lucked out. Someone retired and I got a full-time position. Same thing, the predator supervisor retired, got promoted in there. Um, and now I'm, we restructured, so now I'm the curator. Um, but the, the biggest thing I can, if, I, if there's nothing else you take from anything I've said so far, um, and it's, it's Janae and, and Stacy kind of touched on it, is do internships. Um, do like, even if it's unpaid, just to kind of, if you think you're going to go in that field, try and do something in that field because you may go there and go, this is not for me. Um, we've had vet interns that don't like the sight of blood probably not the field you want to go into. Um, there's a lot of things where it's it's just get your feet wet. And the nice part is if you do internships for companies, they'll remember you usually if you, if you work hard and stuff like that. So it kind of gets your foot in the door when you do graduate where it's, okay, hey, um, I, I'm graduating. Do you guys have an open position? Oh yeah, you were here with a couple. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can work out. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically it. I thought I was going to be a high school biology teacher and now I'm in charge of basically predator animals um, all day. Um, and, and it, it's got its good days and its bad days. Um, you work in the snow, rain, sleet, everything, but, um, it's, it's a fun career. But, uh, if you ask me my freshman year, if this is where I thought I'd be, absolutely not. Um, and I believe that's all I've got. 
Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm not sure what to say about that, but sometimes when a, you know that old phrase, when a, a door opens, a window opens somewhere else, or wherever, however it works. So sometimes the serendipity works really well. So thanks, Mike. So Russ Pitzner is our next speaker. Russ is the practice manager at Red Commerce Solutions. So Russ. Hey everybody, um, thanks for, uh, for for joining us tonight. Um, uh, Michael's um, Michael's talk really kind of inspired me a little bit because he and I apparently have the same major. Um, I graduated also a 704 major, um, which is natural resource management, conservation biology and applied ecology. Um, and, uh, and, and unlike the animal track, I was more interested in the tree side. Um, so I have been a, um, uh, a hunter and a fisher ever since I was a young boy and, um, and, and looking at all these trees, wondering what the heck they were. And um, finally, when I was in college and, uh, and, and took dendrology, um, I, it just absolutely blew my mind that I could actually figure out what these trees were. And, 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 and so now even my, my two little daughters know a little bit of Latin and can, uh, can ID trees. Um, uh, I also had an opportunity to teach uh, dendrology as a, as a teaching assistant my senior year. Um, I graduated back in 97, so I think that might make me the most senior person on the panel tonight. I, I don't know yet. Um, uh, hopefully not. Um, but after graduating, I did move to Oregon um, because, hey, that's where all the big trees were. Um, and, uh, and I thought I would start my career out there. Unfortunately, what I didn't realize was um, very similar to Michael. We were in, in a bit of a recession at the time. And, and unfortunately, the internet was a baby at the time. Um, I actually got my first email address when I was a sophomore in college because there weren't any before that. Um, so so after kind of kicking around in Oregon for a couple of years, trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up, um, I realized that one thing that I was really bad at was finding a job. And, um, and so I, I started looking for how do I find a job and, and I got a career uh, finding jobs for other people. Um, so I am in the staffing industry and um, that doesn't sound very fun or sexy at all, um, but it has really been um, eye-opening for me. It's, it's really grown a lot of different interests for me. Um, so we work with companies like Johnson & Johnson and DuPont, uh, Fujifilm, where we go in and we, we work with the business and IT leaders to really understand what, what it takes to run their company and uh, getting an understanding of the systems they use to run their company. And then we work with them to put people in place to run and manage those systems and run and manage their business. Um, there are different levels of staffing, everything from, you know, please find me an admin to please find me my CEO and, uh, and everything in between. Um, one of the things that I find is interesting is that there is a whole niche of staffing that is dedicated to scientific staffing. These are the people who are finding everything from lab workers to, um, uh, to uh, uh, chemists, to um, you know, surgeons and, and nurses and doctors, all kinds of different staffing um, that's out there in the world. Why do I like it? It is, um, it's challenging. It's, it's kind of cutthroat. It is a sales job. So um, you have to be good with people. You have to like working with people. Um, and also you've got to be really quick on your feet because if, uh, if, if you're not the first one to close the deal, someone's going to jump up and, uh, and, and eat your lunch for you. Um, so I've, I've really enjoyed the business over the year. It is, it is tough. I've been doing it for 20 years now. Um, but I see it really as a means to an end while I love the work. I love mentoring my team and, and working with them. Uh, the main thing I like about it is the freedom it gives me. Um, I run my own day. I don't have a boss telling me what to do every day. Um, I, I wake up and I do what I want. And as long as I hit my numbers, nobody says anything. So that might mean on a Tuesday afternoon at two o'clock, if the weather's nice, hey, I'm going to go out and I'm, I'm going to go fishing. Um, and my boss doesn't care because I'm on my numbers. Um, it could also mean that um, in the middle of the summer when everyone is, is rushing off to Memorial Day weekend, I'm stuck behind a computer looking for SAP consultants for my client that just said they had a need so that I get the placement and, and my competition does not. Um, but the great thing about it is over the years, I have been able to, um, to, to make an income for me and my family that has let me do things that I didn't think would be possible. Um, the biggest thing is buying a farm here in New Jersey. As you know, property is expensive. Um, and, uh, and, and my, my 
fellow students and, and customers at Old Man Rafferty's when I was a bartender would laugh at me and, and say, there's no way that you're going to ever afford to, to own a farm in New Jersey. Property values are too much. Um, and, and just about eight years after those conversations, I bought my first farm. And so now we've got a, it's a small farm, but it's a working farm. We raise um, goats, chickens, uh, beef cattle now and again. Um, my, uh, my daughters spend their summer mornings walking through our big giant garden and, um, and, and you can't even see a house from my front porch. Um, and now I can go deer hunting in my backyard. So um, it's really enabled me to live the lifestyle I've wanted. I've traveled the world on my company's dime and uh, met all kinds of different people and seen different cultures. And, um, and for people who are really interested in lots of fun things to do all the time and also are really good at working hard, and, and you've got to love people too. Um, this is really a, a, a great job for them. So, um, so yeah, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm glad to hear it, but, uh, but thank you so much, Mary. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Russ. And I was just thinking, listening to you and Mike about how you can do science as your, as your avocation, your hobby, uh, you know, or you can make it a hobby for other people. And that's still a great way to do science. So we're going to jump um, through uh, past our next speaker because she's just a kind of, she's had some, excuse me, we're letting uh, our next speaker have a minute to catch her breath. So Michelle, if you don't mind going next, that would be lovely. So Michelle Santos and uh, is the Vice President and National Public Entity Consultant for CBiz Benefits and Insurance Services. So Michelle, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. No, I don't mind going next. Uh, good evening, Cook College students. I'm Michelle Santos, class of 92. So Russ, uh, I am senior to you. <laughs> uh, Hallelujah and thank you. <laughs> I was an environmental science major with a specialty in occupational safety and health. I was also a runner for the Rutgers track and field team and I'm a proud member of the current varsity club. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you for a productive discussion on alternative careers in science, as I was once in your shoes. It was through courses who brought in guest speakers to put me on a pathway to the insurance industry. We are at a pivotal moment in history. A transformation has occurred in education and in the workforce where, where a majority of us are learning and or working virtually. This transform transformation has impacted every industry in some shape or form, disrupting supply chains, disrupting how we will learn, how we will do business, for it will, it will never be the same. Many will be hurt by this change, those who do not have access to technology or cannot pivot to a tech model. Many bu businesses will not survive, incapable of adapting or evolving to change. Many businesses will sustain in this time. They will have to build back better. What this means for you is how you can market yourself, recognizing these changes to brand yourself as an emerging leader, a kid grown from the womb of technology to bring forward solutions and innovation to help companies sustain or to be a part of a transformative solution to this pandemic. We will think about public health differently than we did before. We need students with fresh ideas as there are many, many new opportunities in innovation. We look at the indus insurance industry, which is where I am, the movie industry and sitcoms like to make fun of the insurance sales guy, that people in the insurance industry are really super boring. It's just not true. The company I have chosen to build my career is CBiz Benefits and Insurance, a division of CBiz, a national employer services organization with 5,000 employees and across 34 states. Built with several divisions, we're top in accounting, uh, top insurance brokerage for, firm, as well as financial services, retirement funds, human resources, human capital management, and more. There are two sides of the insurance house, employee benefits or health benefits, and the other side of the house is property and casualty or risk management. As vice president in the benefits and insurance division, I specialize in the public sector, meaning I work with municipalities, counties, school districts, and higher ed institutions. I act as their consultant 
and their benefits program, medical or health benefits, pharmacy, dental, vision, voluntary benefits to help attract and retain employees and keep them healthy. We also drill down into the health of their population, study the trends of the population to create customized wellness programs to keep them healthy, lower claims, in order to lower the cost of insurance premiums to the employer. We also ex excel in pharmacy benefits management to help contain costs for the client using claims data and leveraging our relationships within the pharmacy industry. Taking a step back, I started out of Cook College in the insurance industry on the risk management side, performing risk assessments of businesses across numerous industries. I was very much attracted to health and safety to help protect workers and the community from hazardous conditions. I became a safety engineer utilizing process safety management uh, at highly hazardous chemical manufacturers in New Jersey. However, I had to mitigate my own risks during my childbearing years to limit my exposure to chemicals during my pregnancy. Eventually, I, I you know, I left the industry, but eventually came back to insurance, and this time on the other side of the house and employee benefits. So what are the uncertainties that we're facing now? The pandemic, the spread of COVID-19, how long will this crisis last? How will the pandemic ultimately impact society? What's the total impact on businesses and the gross domestic product? We're seeing record numbers of women quitting their jobs to take care of the family, extended family, and the new virtual world we all live in now. Everyone is at home. Everything has transformed. What does public health need right now? What company will create a successful vaccine? How will the integrity of the vaccines be maintained? Cryogenic transportation, refrigeration, monitoring controls for temperatures to be held at minus 180 degrees. Will they use liquefied helium or liquefied nitrogen? Um, so there's great use in cryogenic applications. So risk mitigation. What happens if there's a power failure during a major nor'easter or hurricane or during transportation of the vaccines, there's a vehicle accident? We must have risk strategies in place to mitigate or lessen the impact of that potential risk. What is insurance? Insurance is a means of protection from financial loss. It's a form of risk management primarily used to hedge against the risk of a contingent or uncertain loss. An organization which provides insurance is known as an insurer, insurance company or insurance carrier who underwrites that risk. The risk is the policyholder who buys the insurance. There is also the broker who oversees the deal between the insurance carrier and the policyholder. The broker advises the client with a number of options available in the marketplace to best suit the needs of the customer with the best value proposition. That's me. So what do we need insurance for? I don't know, everything. Home insurance or rental insurance, protection of the property or contents, furniture, clothing, artwork, but not your pets. Sorry, Fido. Auto, protection of collision or injury, health insurance, protection from the expense of major medical bills, disability and life insurance, protection of lost income from a spouse due to injury or loss of life. And then there's workers' compensation, protection for employers from medical bills for employees injured on the job. Keep in mind, this is where risk management falls into practice. A safety culture with safety and health practices is key here to avoiding workplace injuries as well as liability from pollution, oil spills, chemicals or radiation released into the atmosphere or into waterways. Health, safety and environmental science is key here. You may also think about travel insurance, pet insurance, fire liability, product liability. There are so many, many opportunities with the insurance industry. So safety and health, climatology for global warming, understanding how the market is impacted by all these factors to set premiums, your actuaries, nutrition, epidemiology and population health and wellness programs, risk management specialties, uh, industrial hygienists, certified safety specialists, pharmacy, policy advisors. 
So I'm currently studying at Harvard University at the Kennedy School for public policy to obtain my master's in public administration, just to have a better understanding of policy. So there's so many opportunities uh, in the insurance industry, but the public sector also needs you. Health and human so services, public se safety, health departments, OSHA, DEP, with the upcoming changing of the presidential administration, science will matter again. In conclusion, my message is to you and whatever you choose, just get out there, investigate your interests, be creative and be just as transformative as the times in which we are living. Get a group together for an innovative startup. This is your time. Let nothing stop you, not even a global pandemic, the likes of which the world has never seen before. You must rise. You must become the you and the likes of which you have never seen yourself as before. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And I will never think an insurance agent is boring ever again, I promise. <laughs> So our final speaker who has gone through a lot to get here tonight, we thank you so much, Beth. We're so chatting up with now, your name wrong. It's because I didn't have a chance to ask you. So uh, Beth is the Feasibility Analytics Head for Immunology at Johnson & Johnson. So thank you, Beth, the floor is yours. Well, I'm very thrilled to be here. So thank you for that. And if you were curious, it's Rizosha. Um, and I tell people I married into it. So a mispronunciation doesn't, doesn't offend me at all. So um, I'm really excited to be here because I, um, I've been through a crazy journey, uh, mostly at Johnson & Johnson, and it's a good example of all the different paths your career can take when it has started out you know, in the laboratory, which is where I started. So I um, graduated with um, a degree in biology, and then I went on to get my master's in biotechnology. And so I started out in the labs working for uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and I was doing experiments with Xenopus levis frogs on uh, neural networks. Um, so it was a very traditional laboratory start to my career, and I transitioned that into J and J, doing cell culture for a diabetes um, treatment. So we were looking at a combination product of cells grown in an immuno isolation device, and it was like a really exciting time to be in a lab working on cutting edge technology. Um, and it was my laboratory experience that led me to that position, as well as obtaining my master's. And from there, I. I deviates from the typical lab um, science background um, type of career path, but it's been one that I've enjoyed very much. And so I'm like very excited to share this with you. I made a move from the laboratory into project management. So that was my first step out of the lab and there was an opportunity within my team. So I was in a team of 30 dedicated scientists and engineers and there was an opening where the project manager moved on to the larger organization and I had expressed an interest. And I would say that it's not just interesting to follow someone's path, but what led them to each step along the way and how they made that specific move. That move was available to me because it was having conversations about being ready for the next thing, looking at opportunities, sharing with people what I was passionate about. And I over and over again had stepped into roles where I was like, we, we have to get a system here. We need to create you know, something here to make sure we don't run out of these things. Uh, we need to plan ahead and time things. And so it you know, naturally led to the timeline management and the resource management. And then um, it moved into contracts and I set up systems and created structure where there wasn't any. It was a truly value added to the, our team where we, you know, didn't lose any balls with contracts being dropped and, you know, we were able to visualize the timeline and have those strategic discussions that they really weren't having before. Um, so I, I would say like that first step was me having conversations and all along the way, everything's been conversations with other people, seeing and asking what they like about their job, what is involved with their job and what it's like day to day, right? And so um, on top of that, I did a bit of research on myself, right? Like, what do I like to do? What are my strengths? Our team did a strengths finder exercise and mine was achievement and communication and harmony and um, diligence and analytics, right? And so I, you know, those were my top five strengths. They really are like, I felt like project management my, was my calling. And yet here I am, I'm not in project management anymore. So things changed again, right? So I was in that role with that smaller team of 30. And I thought there's a huge J&J organization out there. What else is there, 
right? So I didn't just stay with that th group of 30 uh, and I did not have an opportunity laid out. So I've never been on a ladder. It's never been obvious my next step. I've always had to find it for myself. So I um, asked my manager to put me in touch with people who were doing project management in the broader organization. And I received a stretch assignment and I always um, advise people to do the same if possible. If you can get an opportunity to work in an area you're interested in, you are free to them. They love it, right? And then you learn the technology, you get to show people how awesome you are, right? So it was a tremendous opportunity for me and I really enjoyed it and people were happy to have my help. And I was um, given opportunities that allowed me to show what I was capable of and turn around, you know, different deliverables, different presentations and, and analytics that they were really excited to have. So uh, that led to an opportunity, right? The a job opened up and I applied for it like everyone else and I was thrilled to get it. Um, and that put me in the larger organization where, you know, J&J is a huge matrix organization. So I came from a small team where you saw everything that happened, you knew everybody who was doing everything and your legal representative sat next to you, right? Into a broad, huge organization where you have to submit a request through a formal system and wait till someone picks up your request in order to have, you know, someone looking at a contract. So it was an opportunity for me to learn and grow. And um, from there, I got sort of snatched up into another area of the organization team that uh, specialized in project management solutions. So I moved from doing standard timelines for neuroscience to doing whatever was needed most in order to support our high profile projects. And that was very exciting because I was seeing all the things that were gonna make the big difference, like whose launches were gonna make a difference for patients, right? So I was helping make those things launch on time through innovative tools, and uh, visuals and dashboards to help the teams really operate at top efficiency. So that was super cool. And I uh, got kind of involved with medical device, like j and is large enough that you're not just stuck in a lab or working with laboratories, right? I started out doing an immunology, neuroscience, and ended up on a robotic knee surgery platform. So it was a segue within the job I was already doing to have that opportunity. And I really loved it, but it was requiring a ton of travel. So here I was, like I was doing what I loved, but I still, it wasn't right for me and my family. So I needed to pivot again, right? So I started from scratch, all those conversations with all those people I'd met over the course of um, my career, what's going on right now close to where I live, right? What job openings are there that I would be a good fit for that um, might interest me and, um, you know, or something that would, the team would benefit from my expertise as well. So I landed um, within data science. So it was a very interesting pivot. It doesn't kind of, my standard trajectory doesn't explain, right? Well, I was working on it with a programming team within that med device project, but how do you go from like a med device to data science? Right? But I would say what sold me on that is at this point in my career, I've developed a network and I have developed skills in working with people and facilitating. And the role I was hired into was really a facilitation role. Can you connect with the data scientists and the programmers? And can you connect with the people who need their products and help them meet to deliver what's actually wanted, not just what someone thinks is cool, um, and, and, you know, not just someone who's touching base infrequently enough that what they end up turning in, so to speak, and organizing this, in this large is not what was asked for. So um, it was kind of a really fun transition and a crazy time. I know, you know, we were mentioning earlier the, the crazy times we're in. I started that job virtually in March. So um, in March, I started as a data science liaison, and then I've transitioned now into leading a team of analytics. So now my title is Feasibility Analytics Head. I'm leading a team that's helping deliver these projects and it's my job to make sure that we're delivering what's needed for the organization. So our analytics help us show um, which sites are best for our clinical trials and uh, which countries are going to be most receptive to the trials based on a variety of factors that includes real world data and um, some deep analytics that help us reach patients faster. So I know I only had five minutes. I don't want to take up too much time, but that was a, and a really, really brief nutshell of uh, my uh, progress to date. Thank you, Beth. So the themes that I hear running across everyone is open to asking questions, 
try different things, be aware that you start in a position in an organization and that there are many, many other jobs you can hold that you're not even aware of exist and that can use the skills and your interest in, in many different ways. So thank you all, this is fantastic. So this